learning. So a few announcements. Homework 2 is due tomorrow. Um, with respect to grading for homework 1, uh, there were a few issues that arose uh, with uh, grading for homework 1 with grade scope in particular. This is the first year we're trying out grade scope, so some issues to be debugged. Uh, we will be posting a few to-dos for grade scope uh, tonight or tomorrow morning before you submit homework two. Um, pretty simple things like make sure the PDF you submit has, uh, has meta tags that identify who you are. So you know, if we need a cross-reference between grade scope and Moodle, it's easy for us. So things like that. Um, so it should be fairly straightforward. Just make sure you have those things uh, set up properly when in your grade scope account. That's all. Um, homework three uh, will be a bit easier than homework two, uh, and the Kaggle competition is the week after homework four is is turned in. Okay, so let's sort of take a look at the landscape of machine learning and sort of where we're at and what is left for us to cover. So the bulk of this class is on supervised learning. We'll also touch a bit on unsupervised learning, spend about a week, a week and a half on unsupervised learning. And within supervised learning and also unsupervised learning, you have a number of different issues uh, that we cover. Things like, you know, what is the model class? We largely look at linear models, although we'll also look at nonlinear models. Uh, what is the notion of overfitting? These things happen in both supervised and unsupervised learning. What is the actual learning algorithm or the optimization of subroutine? Uh, what are the choice of loss functions? Do we care about probabilistic interpretations or probabilistic modeling? And so, you know, we've covered a lot of the things in the middle in the context of supervised learning. Today, we'll still be looking at supervised learning, but we'll be focusing on nonlinear models. But this sort of gives you a roadmap of the types of topics and concepts we like to cover in this class. Okay, so in this lecture, uh, the goal is to let's l try to come up with models or predictors or functions that have the highest possible accuracy, and that that means departing from linear models. These are highly nonlinear models uh, for both this lecture and the next lecture. So let's start with decision trees, which will be the building block for this week's uh, two lectures. And so uh, this is an example of a binary decision tree. Um, so all what happens is the um, the data an input instance x is routed into the, into the root node of the tree, and then it gets routed to a leaf node where it makes a prediction, in this case, one or zero. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward concept. It's literally what you think it is. There's not, there's no, don't overthink it. And so uh, let's sort of walk through an example. Um, so we start at the root node. Uh, sorry, a little bit of terminology for a walk through an example. Uh, the, the root node is called the root node. Every non-leaf node is called an internal node. And uh, leaf nodes. Um, are the ones who have no children. So uh, every internal node has a binary query, query function that splits uh, into one of two paths. Every leaf node has a prediction. In this case, we're doing binary. So excuse me. Uh, binary, I, I just realized right now that binary is overloaded. This is a binary decision tree for binary classification in that the branching factor of the decision tree is 2. We could also have binary decision trees for regression. OK, so prediction starts at the root node, recursively calls the, the, the node-specific query function. And uh, you know, without loss of generality, a positive response means left child. A negative response to the query function means right child. And we recurse until we hit a leaf node, after which we make a prediction. Very standard stuff. So now suppose this is our input. Uh, there are two features here. Uh, and so the root node, the query function of the root node is, is the gender male, yes or no? The answer is no. So we go to the right child. Is the age greater than 11, yes or no? The answer is yes. So we go to the left child and we predict one. And one, as you, as you may recall, is the height is greater than 55 inches. So that's the prediction. That's basically what a decision tree is. OK. So a decision tree is defined by a tree of queries. A, a binary decision tree is defined by a tree of binary queries that maps features into either uh, you know, left child or right child, 0, 1, negative 1, positive 1, however you want to 
or actually formalized. It doesn't really matter. Um, so the basic form is you know, an indicator function uh, on a single feature. So here, we're, we're, we're in this uh, lecture, and by and large in the machine learning community, we, uh, the 99% of the time, the over one majority of the time, decision trees uh, have query functions that only condition on one feature at a time. And so in this case, um, it is you know, whether or not a single dimension of the input feature vector is greater than some constant. If yes, we branch in one direction. If no, we branch in another direction. So we can think of these as axis-aligned partitionings of the input space. So uh, let's look at a sort of a pictorial or geometric view of what's happening. So imagine that we have a two-dimensional input space with a bunch of labeled data. Um, so the you know, two labels, po positive and negative examples. So a root node splits the data, right? in this case along the, um, the y-axis feature. And then each leaf node, can, you can convert that into, a root node, into an internal node by splitting the data. So the top leaf node, we split the data along the x-axis feature. Same with the bottom uh, leaf node. So now they're both internal nodes, and we have four leaf nodes, and so on and so forth. And, in, and if this was our final decision tree, then we make predictions uh, at the leaf nodes. In this case, I just took the majority class in each leaf node. So if, if the leaf node has more positive, we predict positive. If the leaf node has more negative, we predict negative. So this is, gives you a sort of a, a pictorial or geometric view of what a decision tree is learning. Of course, in actuality, it, this is in a much higher dimensional space. But this sort of gives you some. So what is the function class of a decision tree, or the model class? Well, the class of decision trees is the class of piecewise static functions. So piecewise static just means you know, there is an axis line partitioning over the feature space. And inside each partition of the partitioning, we predict a constant number. Any questions on that? OK. So one of the big distinctions that I've raised again and again is that decision trees are nonlinear functions or nonlinear models. Right, so so uh, here's an example, uh, a very simple example, where no linear model can achieve zero uh, classification error. But of course, we can uh, create a decision tree, a very simple one in this simple example that has perfect accuracy. Uh, here's another example. Um, so I, this is kind of a degenerate example in that there's no variability along the second uh, dimension of x. It's just all like this, but yet we can still make a decision tree that has perfect classification accuracy. This is a somewhat counterintuitive when you first see it, but this sort of illustrates the power of piecewise static functions. And of course, in practice, things are high dimensional, much more complicated. And these types of issues actually come up all the time. Or these types of phenomenon come up all the time. OK, so, okay, so that's one of the ways we illustrate the power of decision trees. Uh, there are also some negative or downsides of decision trees. Uh, one is that, well, OK, the way we define decision trees in this class and in the overwhelming majority of the cases in machine learning in general, is using axis-aligned partitions, which means all the boundaries of the partition of the partitioning is aligned with one of the axes. So, so no diagonals. So if you have a decision boundary, so in a linearly separable problem where the decision boundary is a diagonal, which it basically almost always is, then you know, a simple linear model can easily find this decision boundary, but it's actually quite complicated. Or, or awkward for a decision tree to represent this decision boundary. For example, this might be a decision tree that has this boundary. And you know, it's a bit awkward to represent this boundary using a decision tree with access aligned partitions. 
in some sense, you know, so one way we can think of that is that there's a bunch of wasted boundaries that are defined. Here's a more extreme example, right? Here I'm just, I'm not illustrating the full decision tree, just, you know, the part that sits on the actual, the actual boundary. And of course this gets much more ridiculous in high dimensions. But okay, so that, that's sort of one of the issues with decision trees, right? They, they have a lot of, you know, wasted boundaries. So in other case, in other, in other words, uh, maybe maybe it's sort of most relevant here. I, there's a not, there's an actual there's an actual component of the decision tree that captures this boundary, that partitions this data point into a different partition than this data point, and yet it makes absolutely no difference in terms of classification. So in, in some sense, it's wasted model capacity. And this is just the consequence of using access line partitions. But the nonlinearity is often very important for uh, accurate uh, classification. And so in some sense, you know, in many of these applications, it's OK to waste model capacity if we get a more accurate model out at the end. The catch, of course, is that we need enough training data. If we don't have enough training data, as you might imagine, this can really overfit. Uh, here is a, a real decision tree. It's actually on the very small side in terms of real decision trees that people use in practice. Uh, any questions on that? Yes? Um, is it possible to get rid of the problem with the diagonal by doing like a uh, some people do that. Um, so the biggest consequence of these uh, of this issue is that it overfits, or or it you know it. You need to use a lot of little partitions, you know, to, to make it look reasonably smooth or whatever it is you care about. If you really care about smoothness, you would not use axis line partitions. You would use something a little bit smoother. Uh, if you care about just accuracy, and, and you know, the, the issue with these wasted boundaries is that you know, it leads to an unstable model class. If you jitter the data a little bit, you get very different boundaries, right? Um, and so that's, that makes you suspect that, that this decision tree might be overfitting. And, and the majority of this week is talking about how to control for overfitting of decision trees. So it depends on what you're going after. Uh, the nice thing about access aligned boundaries is that they're really simple to implement, they're simple to debug, everything's simple, which you know, has value. And so if you just need to write a wrapper script around the decision tree to control for overfitting, which is what we'll see at the end of this lecture, um, that's typically the way to go. Yes? Do people typically think of decision trees with um, X number of levels as different classes or different hypotheses? So we have a decision tree that's like five levels deep, that's more complex than one that's only two levels? Uh, Yes, so you can have you could define your function class of decision trees. Um, yeah, you could say I want I will only treat decision trees no bigger than this many levels. Or there are different ways of constraining it. We'll actually I'll list up a number of examples later in this lecture. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk about training now. So uh, when we train a decision tree, as you saw in the picture, you know, every data point eventually partitioned, every training point, excuse me, eventually was partitioned into one of the leaf nodes. And so, uh, and because every internal node, uh, every, child, uh, every set of children of an internal node is, a, is an exact partitioning of the input space of the parent node, then we can think of the decision tree as defining a partitioning over the training data. At least this is the way we can think about it when we're doing decision tree training. So, you know, if the training set is capital S, as is usual in this class, then every node is a partition or a subset of S. And every layer defines a complete partitioning of the training set. So the root node contains all of the training set. Every, every, every training example gets routed through the root node. Uh, every training example gets routed to exactly one of these two nodes. 
right? So these two nodes define an exact and complete partitioning of the training set. And every training example gets routed to exactly one of these four leaf nodes. So these leaf nodes define an exact and complete partitioning of the training set. In fact, any proper cut, any proper complete cut of this tree defines a complete partitioning of the training examples. So I, you know, a proper cut could be you know, this guy plus these two. That defines a proper partitioning of the uh, training examples. And so forth. OK, so we're going to use this as the starting point to think about training. So you know, if we had just one node, just a root node, there are no queries, because the root node is also a leaf node in this degenerate case. And so what this means is we're just going to make a single prediction for the entire training set. Because the root node is a leaf node, and at the leaf nodes we, we, we make a prediction. In this case, we're just going to predict the uh, majority class of the entire training set. So it's like the bias term, if you will. Bam. So the simplest decision tree is just a single root node, which is also a leaf node in this special case, corresponds to the entire training set. And it makes a single prediction for the entire training set, which is the majority class. OK. Thought experiment continued. Suppose the decision tree only has two levels instead of one level. So that means for a binary decision tree, it's a root node, which is a, the single internal node, plus two uh, leaf, leaf ch children who are leaf nodes. OK, so this is, a this is not you know, trivial in the sense that it's not just a single prediction. Uh, but you know, one question now is, OK, how many possible unique ways are there to partition the data for a decision tree of this complexity level? A single uh, internal node plus two leaf nodes. That's it. In general, of course, this, the, the number is infinite. Um, you know, if you want to think about the input space, but if we think about uh, unique, uh, if we think about solutions that change uh, how we would make predictions on the training set, which is a finite set of examples, there's a there's only, there's only a finite number of equivalent classes of solutions. Okay, so you know what what you basically do is you know you run kind of a, a for loop uh, through all the axes. In this case, it's two dimensional. So there's, two, there's two axes, and every time, well, no, you know, every time a, an example changes from uh, just being above or to below the th boundary, that changes how we partition the training set. And I'm ignoring the case where two data points are exactly the same. I'm just going to ignore that for simplicity. There's, there are ways of dealing with that. Go write a for loop along the other axis, slide through the space, marking when there is a change when the training examples go from one side to the other side. So number of possible partitions for this very simple, you know, one query decision tree is d times n, where d is the number of features and n is the number of training examples. So that's the total number of possible partitionings that will make a difference uh, on, on how we make predictions on the training set. The next question then is how do we select which of these is quote unquote the best? And keep in mind that I wanted these definitions to be recursive. Uh, so keep that in mind as I, as I walk through these really, really simple examples, is that I want everything to be recursive so that we can build these larger and larger trees. So the way that people in decision tree uh, community, in the decision tree community, uh, think about this, how do you, uh, quantifying what's the best uh, partition, is they use what's called impurity. This is very, very closely related to the loss function that we've seen in class up until now. In fact, one, might, one can argue that it's basically the same thing. But they, they call it impurity. So let's define an impurity function. Uh, the simplest one is 0, 1 loss. Um, so um, let S prime, D 
denote a part a subset of the training examples. So you imagine that S prime are all the training examples that fall into a leaf node. Then we make the majority we then, you know, we, we simply make the prediction that minimizes the zero one loss on this set of training examples. And that and then we look at the disagreement and that is the uh, the impurity. So if, we, if there are more positives than negatives, we predict positive and just count the number of negatives. That's basically what's happening here. If there's more negatives than positives, we predict negative and count the number of positives. That would be the impurity in terms of 0-1 loss. So 0-1 loss impurity. So if, uh, if this is our training set and we just have a single root node, we're just making a single prediction, there's no, there's no, there's no partitioning, then we will predict a positive class and the impurity, it would be 1. If we split it, then we split the training set into two subsets, so two S primes. I'll just call them S1 and S2. The impurity of this guy is zero because we predict positive, and then there's, there are no disagreements. The impurity over here is one because we predict positive, and there's one disagreement. Uh, one interesting thing about this split is that, OK, if I were to choose this split, we, don't, we didn't actually reduce the impurity. Our impurity is still 1. Our overall impurity is still 1 if we sum these two together compared to this. So we didn't actually accomplish anything. And we could you know, consider all possible splits of the, uh, of the training data, as you know, I illustrated in the previous slide. And then we can find one in this simple example that actually reduces the impurity. And so one might, um, one might argue that this is the best uh, decision tree of size, of, of size uh, 2. Right, so impurity is basically a loss function. The training goal is to find a decision tree with low impurity over the partitionings. Um, Impurity summed over the leaf nodes is basically the training loss. So the impurity of the entire training set is equal to the partitioning. So each, so the S prime iterates over the leaf nodes, and the union of S prime is exactly the original training set. And we look at the impurity of each leaf node. And, the, and this is again the definition in terms of zero one, zero one loss. Yes. So what do you do um, if you have the same number of Positive and negative in the region. Like if you classify like for positive and negative, do you continue to subdivide or like, do you choose a convention? Uh, there's a question of the stopping credit condition, which I'll get to later. There's a there, there are two questions there. I think there, I think you were asking two questions. Okay. The first question was, so what do you, so what okay, what do you do has two possible intended questions. One is, what, do I make a pr what, what prediction do I make if that is a leaf node? And two is, do I keep recursively subdividing? Which is, do I keep continuing training? Those are two questions. In the first question, you just simply predict zero. You won't predict positive or negative. That almost never happens in practice that you would do that. Um, but let's say you, but you, you could, uh, in which case you will always get, in which case this, you know, this impurity is always one or always a large number, and then the question. Then the question is, do I continue splitting that uh, node, leaf node, into an internal node with leaf nodes of its own, children of its own? And the answer is usually yes. We'll have stopping conditions of when we would not do that. We'll see that later in the class, in the in the lecture. I, I want to first touch on a problem with zero one loss as an impurity measure. It should come as no surprise to you that this is probably not the best choice of impurity measure uh, for training, even though you might want to use it for evaluation after training. Um, so you know, in this example, there is literally no way to, for a single piecewise, uh, single axis aligned partition of the data to actually reduce the impurity if the impurity is zero one loss.
All partitions give the same purity reduction, zero. And the problems are well, as you, what you might expect. You know, it's flat and discontinuous everywhere. So, you know, it, it doesn't mean it doesn't. It, it can often mean that you won't make any progress uh, because you know it, it, this split, even though it doesn't improve the zero one loss, you know, intuitively we're making progress because we know that the next split can actually get us where we want to be. So we're going to use some smoother surrogate measures for impurity. That's not zero one loss. So the first one that we'll look at, which is uh, one that's, um, I don't want to say it's very popular, but it's, uh, it's, it's very qualitatively similar to the popular ones, which we'll look at in the, in the next few slides. Um, but the first one we're going to look at is called Bernoulli variance. Uh, and the basic idea is uh, we're going to measure the impurity of a, of a subset of the data in a leaf node as the um, as the basically thinking about the the data points the data examples in this uh, leaf node as Bernoulli random variables with you know probability with this probability of being positive and this probability of being negative and what's the variance of that random variable and so that basically equals this the number of positive examples times the number of negative examples divided by the size of the size of the uh, this particular partition So, you know, if it's half and half, it has the worst impurity. And if it's completely positive or completely ne uh, ne negative, it has the best impurity, which is zero. Yes? I think I'm missing something fundamental about uh, what you're calling impurity. Can you go back to the couple slides? Yeah, one more. One more. One more. Yeah. Uh, even one more. Yeah, there. So your S1 group, you're saying should be positives, and your S2 group should be negatives, or your S2 group should be positive, your S1 group should be uh, They should both be positive, because in both of them, the majority class is positive. This is a, so given that this is the decision tree that I'm committing myself to, Given that this is the partitioning of the data that I'm committing myself to, both leaf nodes should predict the positive class. And then the question is, okay, given that that's the case, what partitioning should I commit myself to? Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about a smoother, let's go back to the smoother surrogate measure. This is what it looks like. So this is the fraction of positive examples in the, uh, in the leaf node defined by S prime, <coughs> or corresponds to, corresponding to S prime. And as, um, as the, um, and I'm, um, the, the y-axis here is ignoring the size of the set S prime. So it's just, I'm just assuming S prime equal, the size of S prime is one. Of course, you could just scale it up and down depending on the size of S prime. Um, so at 50% uh, positive, 50% negative, it has the highest impurity. And at 0% uh, positive or 100% positive, it has the lowest impurity. OK, so let's go back to this example that doesn't have any split that reduces the 0, 1 loss, or any single split that reduces the 0, 1 loss. So this is the impurity of the, uh, of the uh, data. We split it like this. This is the subsequent impurity of each of the leaf nodes. Here's a different split with the uh, impurity of the different leaf nodes. And you know we can sum them together and see that this one's the best. In practice, you have to go through all possible splits, but that's sort of the idea. So 
So uh, one, way, one way to think about Bernoulli variance is, OK, we're basically saying that each partition is a distribution over the labels. And the labels is, are Bernoulli distributed with expected value equal to the uh, equal to the fraction of positive versus negative examples. And we want to find a partitioning where each partition has low variance in the distribution. Here's some other impurity measures. So one, uh, the, more, more, the more popular ones are based on entropy. And so this is just the definition of entropy. Uh, and we basically look for um, partitions of the uh, of the uh, of the training set or the data set in this internal load uh, to into, into 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 two sets that reduces the entropy as much as possible. This is also known as information gain in the in the information theory community. Here's another one called the Gini index. And the thing that I, I, I want you to um, get out of this is that they all kind of look qualitatively the same, right? All, all of these different uh, impurity measures look qualitatively look, look the same. And in fact, information gain is probably the most popular um, uh, impurity measure that people use in, when training decision trees. Um, but it, as you can see, it, probably, it doesn't really make a difference which one of these you use. They all kind of look the same qualitatively. <coughs> So now, when, up, to, up until now, we've covered how to train decision trees with one uh, binary query, with one split of the training data. Uh, we're going to use this to do a recursive definition, but is there any are, are, uh, for for a general training? Um, but are there any questions up until this point? Yes. Um, it's a good question. Probably. Um, what people typically do in practice is you, 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 choose the, you only choose the split that's exactly in between two data points. Because without, in the absence of more information, that seems like the sort of the, the, the worst, in the worst case, that seems like the best you can do. The question is more interesting in the case of regression and not classification, where you want to make a smoothly varying prediction. So that it becomes a little bit more complicated there, and people have, to have looked at that this issue, but in classification, it, it basically never comes up as a practical consideration. Okay, so now we're going to talk about top-down training. So this is a greedy algorithm. And so we recursively um, choose the split. We, we, we look at the current decision tree that we've trained so far, and we, and we take a look at um, a leaf node, and we choose the split that has the greatest uh, impurity measure uh, reduction over all possible leaf nodes. So uh, I'll, I'll explain what it means in, a, in an example. So in step one, we have just a root node, which uh, is Un, just basically corresponds to the entire training set and has an impurity. It's the only leaf node. So we're going to consider all possible splits of this leaf node into uh, two leaf nodes. And we're going to pick uh, this split that has the maximum impurity reduction over all possible splits of this leaf node. And then we loop over all the leaf nodes. So we loop over this leaf node and, tr and find its best possible split. We loop over this leaf node and find its best possible split. And then we commit to one. And then we keep doing this until we have a stopping condition. And that's the top-down recursive uh, definition uh, training algorithm for decision tree training. It's also known as top-down induction. Yes? Um, I see why this is best if you limit yourself to greedy algorithms, but I assume you could do better with the non greedy algorithm in some cases. Uh, optimal, opti finding the decision tree that has the op that optimizes the, part the, the impurity at the leaf nodes is NP hard or NP complete, depending on exactly how you define the problem. 
And so pe practice people just do top down greedy. Yeah. So how do you choose the order of the feed period that enter the query function? So why do we do mail first instead of page? Oh, um, so. Uh, so that was answered in the previous slide where we looped over all possible splits. So, so in, the, in the previous slides, we, we looked at looping over all possible splits of the data and choosing the one that has the best impurity reduction. I assumed I just solved that as a subroutine, when I, when I, and, and this was the best answer. And so now we're going to apply that what we saw in the last few slides as a subroutine over and over again. Yes. There are ways to speed this up, but I'm giving you sort of the, 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 the first cut algorithm. So what this looks like in practice is, maybe this answers your question, we have the root node, which is a leaf node. We try all possible splits of the, of the, uh, of the root node, and we commit to one. Now we have two leaf nodes. We loop over both leaf nodes, trying all possible splits of both leaf nodes. I had a lot of fun making these slides. Uh, and then we uh, commit to one. Right? So we decided to split the top leaf node. Then we loop over all possible leaf nodes. And you know this recursively uh, happens until we get to this. And let's say we decided to stop here. I haven't talked about stopping condition yet, but let's say we stop here. So some properties of top-down training. Every intermediate step of this algorithm is a decision tree. We can stop whenever we want and get a decision tree out. Uh, this is a key algorithm, so we don't backtrack, so which means we cannot reconsider high-level splits that we, com we committed to already. We can only keep splitting the ones uh, amongst the leaf nodes that we've already committed to. So now the question is, okay, when do we stop? So uh, just as a thought experiment, here is two decision trees uh, of, the, um, of the same data. This one is just a further uh, partitioning of this guy. Um, one of these has better training error than the other. But the question really is, which one has better test error? Right? So you know, if we keep going, in many, in many data sets, we can get a decision tree with zero training error. Just keep recursively partitioning until we, every leaf node is pure. But that decision tree is probably overfitting to the training data. So how do we do early stopping? How do we do regularization? What, you know, what, what do these concepts mean in decision tree training? Uh, clearly, uh, the most obvious form of regularization is that we, don't, we shouldn't have leaf nodes that are too small. That's sort of the obvious definition of, uh, of regularization. There are a few other ones. So here are the stopping conditions. Minimum size. Do not split further if the resulting children are, have, le have uh, le uh, training data allocated to them smaller than some minimum size, like 10 or 50 or, or, or 100, depending on your training. Uh, task. Maximum depth. Do not split to the resulting children are beyond some maximum depth of the tree. Maximum number of nodes. Do not split if the tree already has a maximum number of allowable nodes. A minimum reduction in impurity. Do not split if the resulting children do not reduce the impurity by at least some fractional percentage. Or percentage. All of these are valid. Uh, I would say that the first one is probably the most common, minimum size. So you just pick a size, like 25, and just keep splitting until all the leaf nodes are, uh, until none of the leaf nodes can be, until you cannot create leaf nodes without making one less than 25 in terms of the number of training examples. Yes? So with all these methods, would you still split the leaves that are perfectly possible? No. <coughs> Here's some pseudocode. I don't think I'll go over it. It's what you might expect. It looks a lot like uh, what you might see in your you know, data structures class. So I want to talk a little bit about classification versus regression. 
Um, in classification, which is what we talked about thus far, um, the labels are, in this case, binary, although it could be have more than two classes. Uh, in regression, the labels are real valued. In classification, you predict the majority class in the leaf node. In regression, you predict the average of the targets in the leaf node. Um, both are piecewise constant function classes. Both minimize some sort of impurity. So in classification, the goal is to minimize zero one loss, although we do it indirectly with a smooth surrogate impurity function. And in regression, the answer is a bit simpler. We just minimize squared error as the impurity measure directly. But otherwise, things look exactly the same for regression. So what's the time complexity for the uh, algorithm? So per, per, um, per inductive, per recursive step, it's d times n, where d is the dimensionality and n is the number of training examples. So, so we look at every possible axis split, and then, you know, then so it's d times n times the number of recursive calls. So just a recap, um, this is training is done top down, minimize impurity until some stopping condition, condition is met. And to recap decision trees, it's a piecewise constant function class, not linear, very important. Um, it's, you, we train it to minimize impurity on the training data and often is much more accurate than linear models if we have enough data. To train them reliably. Yes. I have I have not seen a decision tree used in practice that was not binary. Doesn't mean they don't exist, but yeah. Was there another question? Or yeah, sorry. In, in practice, I guess I guess here we're we're considering you know something that. From the get-go, uh, reduces the impurity below this margin. But um, are there cases where that's not the right, like first step? Sure. I mean, this is why it's 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 MP hard or MP complete um, to find, depending how you exactly define the problem, to, how to uh, find the optimal decision tree. Because this greedy impurity reduction is not always the right thing to do. But I can I can do reductions showing that it's just computationally tractable to find the best thing. Yes, was there a question? Okay. Okay, so the second topic of today is, is bagging, also known as bootstrap aggregation. Um, so the outline for the last part of the lecture today is first we're going to do a recap of the bias variance trade-off, then we'll introduce bagging, and then we'll introduce a random force, which is a, which is a small variant or extension of the bagging approach. So let's start with a recap of the bias variance trade-off. So uh, these are slides from lecture one. Hopefully it's just a review for everyone at this point. We have a true distribution of data that is unknown to us. We only have access to a training set of finitely number uh, many training examples sampled uh, in, from this distribution. Each sample is assumed to be independent. We train a classifier or regressor. We train a predictor on this training set. That, and so I, I denote here that this predictor is the output of a learning algorithm operating on this training set. So if we were to repeat this process and collect a new training set uh, randomly from this distribution, then the resulting predictor would be slightly different or, or very different if there's high variance in the function class. The test error then it, of this predictor is then the actual loss on, over the uh, expectation on the true test distribution. Overfitting is the, what happens when test error is much higher than training error. So you know we have a true distribution, and we subset when we sample from it to get this training set, and you know we train a classifier on this training set, and this is the training error, and the test error is the error on this this guy on all of these. And so uh, the bias variance decomposition, um, here we're going to focus on squared loss because it's mathematically much simpler, uh, looks like this. So the ex we now have an expectation over the training set. So 
we imagine a thought experiment where we could repeat the train the entire pipeline of collecting training data and training a model over and over again. So what we will do is first collect the training set that sampled IID from the true test distribution. Then we tr run a subroutine or a learning algorithm that gives us a classifier, or sorry, in this case, a predictor, a condition on this training set. So this, this predictor is a random function, random variable function, if you will, uh, that whose randomness depends on the randomness of the sampling procedure to, to collect the training set. Then the expected error of this function class with respect to tr this training set random variable looks like this. And so for squared error, we can write this out and into a variance term and a bias term. Recall that we use this concept known as the aggregate predictor or the average prediction, which is, you know, for this input, what is the average prediction that our that our learning algorithm would, would, would spit out over the randomness of the training set collection procedure? And so the bias term is the squared error between the average predictor and the true label. And the variance term is actually independent of the true label in squared in the case of squared loss. And it's the deviation of any individual predictor uh, from the uh, average predictor. And we could see this simple example. Well, this is our regression. We have uh, x is one dimensional and we were just doing regression. So the um, so the y axis, uh, the, the y is the, is, the, is the target label and the x is the one dimensional feature. And uh, the red dots are the test distribution. And so, you know, if we were to sample seven data points for training and train a linear model, and we, we, we were to be able to repeat this process, this is sort of the variability we would get. For a quadratic regression model, we, this is the variability we would get. And then for cubic. And now we can sort of show the bias variance trade-off, where in the top row, we have the average prediction of the linear function, the quadratic function, and the cubic function. This is sampled over something like a thousand um, samples of the training set. And then the green line is the standard deviation of any individual predictor from the, bi uh, from the average predictor. And the bias variance trade-off says the test error um, um, uh, is simply decomposes additively into the bias term and the variance term. And the total test error is the sum of the two. And you want to find, you want to choose the function class that minimizes the bias variance, uh, that, that minimizes the sum of bias plus variance, and therefore optimizes the bias variance trade-off. So this should be review at this point. The reason uh, I bring this up, I'll, I can, I'll just skip this slide. Uh, actually, no, uh, I, want to, I want to emphasize this slide. So high variance implies that your function class um, high variance of your function class means that your function class is likely to overfit to training sets of this size, which means if you were to randomly, if you were able to redo this whole process and collect another training set of the same size, you might get a very, very different function out of the training procedure. So the model class is unstable. Variance increases with more complex model class, but it reduces with more training data. Bias implies underfitting. Uh, even with no variance, if we, even if we had an, a training set that's infinitely large, we, the model class still has high error. We, we, like, you know, it, we, there's no way we can fit a linear function with low error, even if we had infinite data. So even with no variance, the test error is going to be high because the bias is that bad. Bias decreases with uh, more complex model classes. And uh, this, this statement is not 100% true, but effectively, it, the bias is independent of the training set size. OK. So you know, this is a decision tree that we trained. And these are the training examples. And the true test distribution has a lot more examples that we don't actually get to see. And if we were to, you know, that's, I denote that with the, with the smaller labels. And if we were to draw another collect another training set in a thought experiment uh, from this test distribution and retrain, we might get a you know, pretty different model. So decision trees are low bias, high variance models, unless you regularize a lot. 
In which case, if you regularize a lot because you have a lot of wasted model capacity, uh, heavily regularized decision trees are actually much worse than linear models. So how do we deal with this? That's where bagging comes in. Bagging says, OK, we have a function class that is high variance, like the class of decision trees. OK, let's try to reduce that variance. So in the ideal setting, what would we do in, if we look at the bias variance trade-off, that I just, which I just rewrote here? Um, in the ideal setting, we would say, let's just collect a bunch of, different, a bunch of training sets of the same size as the original one you know, over and over again from the true distribution. So let's sample a bunch of training sets of, of this size from the, from the true distribution. We train the model on each of these, and then we average their predictions. What that, what that means is you know, we would go from having a single model that has all this variability to one that gets closer and closer to the black line. The average is, because the black line is the, is the actual average. So if we were able to average a bunch of these different models, we would get the black line back. So that's sort of the, that's sort of the starting point. Of course, this is impossible because we only have one training set. But this is sort of the starting point in terms of the thought experiment that motivates bagging. Because as we average, more and more of these random variables, the variance reduces linearly, but the bias is unchanged. OK, so we can't do this in practice, because we only have one training set. So what bagging does is it resamples a new training set, an inter a temporary training set from the original training set, by simply sampling from the training set with replacement. So we have this original, we have, me, we have the true test distribution. From it, we sampled a training set. And now we're going to resample from this guy with replacement to create this S prime. And we're going to train a model using this um, resampled with the replacement training set. And then we average the predictions. This process of resampling with replacement is also known as bagging. <coughs> Sorry. It's also known as bootstrapping. <laughs> And this is why bagging stands for bootstrapped aggregation. Of course, because each S prime uh, that we sample from bootstrapping are correlated with each other, then the variance is not going to reduce linearly. It's going to reduce sublinearly. It's probably going to asymptote to some, to some value that doesn't go to 0. And you, you may also increase the bias slightly by doing this process, because we're not actually sampling S prime from the true test distribution, but from bootstrapping from S. But that's the basic idea. So here's the, here's how, here's the sort of the procedure. We have a training set S. We generate many bootstrap train, uh, uh, training samples from S. And uh, the bootstrapping is basically sampling with replacement from S to get a training set of the exact same size. Then we train a high variance decision tree with not much regularization on this uh, S prime. So this is high variance, low bias. And the final prediction is the average of all these trained decision trees. And the hope is that this averaging will reduce the, uh, the variance. Yes? Uh, I have a question about how to average decision trees. So let's say you have some data set you train on it. And the first, uh, I forget the term, but the first Decisions made on uh, X1. So you only add, you average their outputs. So let's say it's 100, and 80 of them predicts the positive class for this example X, and 20 of them predicts the negative class, and we predict the positive class. If we need to predict the real value, if we need to predict the confidence, we would say 80% confidence positive. So you don't you don't average you don't average the you treat each decision tree as a black box. You simply average their predictions. Yes? If you did like decision trees with regression, would you just retain them? Because you can't really average. You can average the predictions. You can always average predictions of functions. It doesn't matter if they're decision trees or any other function. 
It's just an f of that. You have a bunch of f of x's that outputs a number, and you just compute the average of those outputs. Doesn't ma doesn't even matter what f is actually. Uh, so if it's regression, you, you in that case you got unlucky, but you would still predict the average. If it's classification and those are two different classes, you predict the majority class. Yes. So what's the advantage of replacement uh, instead of using like sub uh, subsets of the original data set? So bootstrapping is uh, is ha has a long history in the statistics community as a way of generating variance when you only have one tr data set. And uh, there, are, there are certain properties that come from the fact that you want the exact same size. I don't have time to get into all of it. I, I do have time to get into a little bit of it, but not all of it, which I'll touch on. But it's a, it, has, it has a lot of applicability beyond just training on the decision tree ensembles. It has applicability in like, um, measuring like, um, Statistical significance of a scientific experiment and all that, all, all that, all those stuff. So we, we simply just borrowed all that machinery and left that part as is. Okay, so this is just the one empirical performance uh, and, uh, um, evaluation, um, and so there's here we have um, three. Uh, I think this is um, three different types of decision trees, perhaps. Um, and you see the color coding, they were able to decompose bias versus variance, and you see that the bias, you know, it stays, basically stays about the same, you know, there's some numerical differences, and the variance goes down by a lot. It doesn't go to zero, but it goes down by a lot. So why does bagging work? So. Let's say we have an ideal aggregate, aggregate predictor. I'll call this H sub A. H sub A is that idealized, idealized case where we can draw a bunch of training examples of the same size from the test distribution over and over and over again. And it's the average prediction of, those, of, 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 the, of the predictors trained on each of these uh, training sets. So this is ideal. It's unachievable in practice, but uh, it's something we can think about in terms of analysis. So let's start, work, start with the ideal aggregate predictor. And again, we'll work with square loss because it's mathematically more convenient. Um, this is just, uh, so this is, the, um, this is the expected square loss of a single xy pair. So I, I took out the, uh, at the outside expectation over all possible xy pairs on the training set on, on the test distribution. So it looks like this. Uh, this is just uh, the distributing. Um, squared loss and linearity of expectation. I just move the y outside the expectation because it doesn't actually depend on the expected value over the training set you've, that you've collected. And then you appeal to, um, this is basically a form of what's called Jensen's inequality. Um, you move the square from inside the expectation to outside the expectation. This becomes an inequality, a well-known mathematical fact. Um, this is the definition. The inside here is the definition of the ag aggregate predictor, the ideal aggregate predictor. Um, and then we do the reverse distributed rule, get back this. And this is the loss of the aggregate predictor. So the only thing that the only thing in this whole thing that's an inequality is this step right here. So what does that mean? That means that the aggregate predictor improves on the expected, uh, on the test error, if this is true. And this is a large improvement if the function class is unstable. Or you could expect this to be a large improvement if the function class is unstable. Bagging is a little bit different, but you know, uh, and it's more complicated. I won't go through the whole derivation. Um, but instead of the ideal aggregate predictor, we have this bagging, this bootstrapping thing going on here. 
So it's not always guaranteed to work, but this inequality sheds insight about when you might expect it to work. Any questions? Yes? Uh, is, is, do people generally try to find a procedure to kind of deal with sample size? Uh, or like, is there a way to do that? The ideal sample size? Yeah, so... Like how many samples? Like. Every bootstrap? Yeah. 100. It matches your training set size. The bootstrap procedure from statistics creates a new training set that's sampled with the replacement from your, from your original training set of size equal to your original training set. No, no. Some of them, some some training set, some training examples will be included multiple times, and some will be excluded. Yeah. Yes. So, like intuitively, you think about it as in the true distribution, a lot of the points will be very similar. So, by duplicating the points, you're actually getting more information from this set. Are making the assumption that the training sets, training examples that you have are so, at least somewhat representative. And so if I were to draw another sample, you might get a few more data points in this region and less data points in this region, if I, or fewer data points in this region if I were to collect my training set again. And it doesn't make too big a difference to me if the data points in this region are all exact same data points. You can imagine how this might fail in practice, but surprisingly, it works quite well most of the time. Well, surprising to me. Perhaps not surprising to Leo Bryman, who invented the method. <laughs> so when is HPLX So the, the problem with this analysis is that it's very abstract. And like giving concrete conditions to this is very, exactly very hard. Because it's also a function of the size of S. It's not just your function class. It's also a function of your size of S. So you can analyze it um, empirically. Mm -hmm. you, Yeah, there's, a depend there's an implicit dependency here on the size of your training set. OK, in the final uh, five-ish, 10 minute -ish minutes, I'm going to talk about random forests. So um, again, the goal is to reduce variance. We have this bias variance trade off. We saw bagging as a way of, to some extent, reducing variance of a high variance, low bias function class through bootstrap aggregation. OK, can we do even more? One of the things that's nice about bagging is that it's actually agnostic to the function class. You can use any function class and do bagging. Of course, bagging will only work for high variance function classes, but it's actually agnostic of the function class. In random forests, we're going to take the idea of you know, this sort of random sampling even further, but do it in a way that's specific to decision trees. In other words, <clears throat> bagging can only do so much because resampling the training data asymptotes. We cannot reduce the variance beyond a certain uh, limit because we're just resampling from, the, from one training set. So the idea behind random forest is that we're going to sample data and features. 
So here's the procedure. We have a uh, we have a sample S prime that we sampled by bootstrapping from the original training set. And then we're going to train it to symmetry, just like, just like bagging. However, at every recursive uh, step of the top-down training of the decision tree, we're going to sample a random subset of the features to split on. We won't allow all possible splits to be considered. We're going to randomly select which features we're allowed to split on. And this further introduces diversity and variability into the decision trees. And then we average. We average everything. Yeah, so the idea is that we get further decorrelation and therefore further variability. And therefore, when we average them together, we can reduce the variance even more of the function class. All right, so you know, we have the root node. We randomly decide only to look at the age feature, not the gender feature. So we split on age. Then we randomly decide only to look at gender on this over here. Randomly decide only to look at age over here. Pick the best split, and then recursively do that while training the decision tree. And this is ignoring the fact, and this, this part is ignoring the fact that we are also bootstrapped the training set. Okay, so just to recap, uh, random forests are an extension of bagging uh, that includes sampling of features. The sampling of features is specific to decision trees. We can imagine variants of random forests for other function classes, but random forests itself is specific to decision trees, whereas, boots, or whereas bagging is agnostic to the function class that you're using. But in the end, of course, we're averaging just like before. And so here is an experiment. Um, it's a bit complicated, but um, basically you see here that um, random forests are amongst the best performing methods for many classification tasks. Once you get to a lot more training data, um, deep neural nets tend to do a bit better. Uh, but random forests are still very good. And in fact, it's, it's, you know, people still often use them for many tasks today. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge for the Kaggle competition. Okay, so next section, we'll look at boosting. What boosting does is it takes a low variance function class and it tries to combine it in different ways to reduce the bias, uh, and then also ensemble selection. That's it.